Beneath the skyscrapers of Manhattan lies Greenwich Village with its clusters of old townhouses and tenements. It still has the feel of a neighborhood with its small shops and cafes, streets that actually bend, and stores that are decades old. Generations of writers and artists have celebrated the stubborn, independent character of the village and its success in containing more lifestyles and ideas than any other place in America. Village anarchist Hippolyte Havel described the village in 1915 as a spiritual zone of mind. He said, a city which has no Greenwich Village has no life, no illusion, no art. Isolated from commercial colonial New York, Greenwich Village became a haven for city dwellers during the fever epidemic of 1798. Many decided to stay, and residents grew protective of their neighborhood. In 1817, they opposed the city's grid plan to straighten out the streets. They preserved the curves of old Indian paths and property lines. But the village remained on the physical and social outskirts of the city until 1826, when New York society arrived. The wealthy settled around Washington Square, which was once a potter's field and execution ground with its very own hanging tree. The 300-year-old elm still stands and is the oldest tree in the city. As the area became residential, the square was transformed into a fashionable parade ground for the 7th Regiment, only to find that the artillery on display sometimes caved into the graves below. Finally, Washington Square Park was created. The Victorian village became a synonym for cosmopolitan gentility. This was the world of writer Henry James, who visited a parlor like this one in his grandmother's mansion on the north side of the park. James was born in a house just off the park, behind NYU's old main building on Washington Place. Along with the Astor Library and the Astor Opera House, New York University gave the neighborhood an intellectual air. To celebrate its village past, NYU gathered village writers, Grace Paley, Galway Cannell, E.L. Doctorow, and Louis Auchincloss, to read from village writers of the past and from their own work. The Dagonets of Washington Square, who came of an old English country family allied with the Pitts and Foxes, the Lannings, who had intermarried with the descendants Like Henry of James, Brass, Edith Wharton grew up the within the fortress of New York society the among Dutch the venerable families on Washington Square. Louis Auchincloss reads from The of Age of Innocence. Mrs. Henry Van der Leiden had been Louisa Dagonet, and her mother had been the granddaughter of Colonel Dublat. I wish you would go with me, Newland, his mother said, suddenly pausing at the door of the brown coupé. Louisa is fond of you. And of course, it's on account of dear May that I'm taking this step. And also because if we don't all stand together, there will be no such thing as society left. In the post-World War I era, uh, when she became disillusioned, as so many people did with modern times, then the sort of stillness and staidness of that brownstone New York began to have a kind of nostalgic charm to her. And in the Age of Innocence, she reverted to it and uh, found that it had a fragrance that, she, hadn't, that uh, she had not realized. But I don't think it did. I think the fragrance was her nostalgia. Although the north side of the park refused to surrender its self-respect till the turn of the century, the south side of the park succumbed much earlier to waves of immigration. It was home to free blacks, starting in 1850, to the French, then to Germans, Irish, and Italians. These transient populations lived in newly built but quickly overcrowded tenements and run-down houses. Charles Carter brought his bride to his comfortable home on Bleecker Street in 1850. Fifty years later, it was surrounded by flop houses and brothels, 
Minetta Lane was described by young reporter Stephen Crane as swarming with desperados where sin shone like a new headlight. Despite this seedy reputation, real estate speculators started buying the property south of Washington Square in 1910. They promoted it as New York's Latin Quarter. The wealthy continued their move northward. The mansions were broken up into rooming houses and rents dropped. Eight to twelve dollars a month got you a cold water flat. Thirty dollars got you heat and hot water, and landlords often donated a month's free rent. It was during these years that the village became a haven for writers and artists, anarchists and pacifists, feminists and social reformers from small towns and big cities, with Ivy League degrees and with grade school diplomas, all searching for material freedom in cheap rents and food, and the artistic freedom and support of a thriving creative community. By 1912, it all seemed to come together, and the next four years were called the Golden Age of the Village. These poor but lively Garrett artists called themselves Bohemians, a term previously used to describe a Second Avenue cigar maker. Socialist editor Max Eastman described the attraction of this self-imposed isolation. I want to be very close to that exciting current of life and business that flows on the main avenues, but I don't want to live right in it. So I seek out the little low-roofed cove where only an occasional backwater eddy of the main stream reaches me. The Bohemians rejected the values of their parents, threw away their corsets, smoked in public, and romanced with a clear disregard for Victorian morality. They believed in birth control, women's suffrage, psychoanalysis, left-wing labor movements, and free love. These rebels felt at home with the immigrants who gave the neighborhood a flair with lots of red wine, garlic, and a cosmopolitan flavor. Café Bertolotti was popular with its sawdust-littered floors and cod oil lamps. Signora Bertolotti, known as Mama, was famous for her lunch of minestrone soup, bread and butter, and red wine for 15 cents. Grace Godwin, on the corner of Washington Square South and Thompson, was known for her exotic dish of spaghetti. In 1913, Mabel Dodge began her salon at 23 Fifth Avenue, inviting the radical young artists of the village. Writer John Reed would argue with Max Eastman, artists like Marguerite and William Zorak showed their work. In her studio in McDougal Alley, heiress Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney welcomed young painters. She supported drawing sessions and a gallery for their modernist art that was scorned by the establishment. Her collection grew, and by 1931, she moved it to larger quarters on 8th Street and called it the Whitney Museum of American Art. The house at number three Washington Square North, converted into studios in 1884, was home to painters William Glackens, Edward Hopper, and John Sloan. In 1917, a group of villagers climbed to the top of Washington Square Arch and declared the village independent from the rest of the United States. John Sloan captured the moment in his etching, Arch Conspirators. John Reed wrote, Yet we are free who live in Washington Square. We dare to think as uptown wouldn't dare. These villagers were also reformers and social workers. Henrietta Rodman advocated birth control and the right for women teachers to keep their jobs after marriage. Mary Simkovich founded Greenwich House to help the immigrant poor. She was often baffled by the bohemian enchantment with cellar studios that she had previously condemned as being unfit for habitation. And they were writers. Journalist Ida Tarbell wrote an expose of Standard Oil, helping to break up the company's monopoly of the oil industry. Theodore Dreiser came to the village and wrote an American tragedy on St. Luke's Place. Small radical magazines like The Masses blossomed in those fertile years. Masses editor Max Eastman boasted that its policy was aimed to please and conciliate nobody, not even its readers and they were playwrights. McDougal Street was home to the Provincetown Players, 
where prime movers George Cram Cook and John Reed rented the parlor floor of a brownstone and put in a stage and wooden benches. The Playwrights Theater was dedicated to staging new works by American dramatists and to not judging success by box office receipts. It was here that Eugene O'Neill had his New York debut with Bound East for Cardiff. The village not only welcomed his stark, brooding plays, but provided him with a string of characters, many of whom came from his favorite bar on the corner of 4th Street and 6th Avenue, the Golden Swan, known to its customers as the Hell Hole. O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh is filled with people he met there as his Charles Demuth's painting at the Golden Swan. For its second season, the Provincetown players moved three doors down to a converted stable. It became a village oasis with Polly's Restaurant next door, the Liberal Club below, Washington Square Bookshop on the other side, and Christine's Dining Room above. It was into this cultural center in 1917 that a recent Vassar graduate and poet came to audition for a play and walked away with the lead. She also walked away with many men's hearts. Edna St. Vincent Millay's comparison of youth to the lovely light of a candle burning at both ends became a metaphor for her bohemian generation. Literary critic and Millay admirer Edmund Wilson kept a detailed diary of the times. E.L. Doctorow reads from the 20s. And then he briefly describes the evening of a farewell evening with Edna at which John Peel Bishop, the Greenwich Village poet, was present. And he says, after dinner, sitting on her daybed, John and I held Edna in our arms. <laughs> According to an arrangement insisted upon by herself, I her lower half and John her upper. <laughs> with a polite exchange of pleasantries as to which had the better share. She referred to us, I was told, as the choir boys of hell and complained that our both being in love with her had not even broken up our friendship. You know, my image of Edna Millay is quite different than my original image of Edna Millay. When I was a little boy, there was a terrible event in World War II. The Germans went to this village called Lidice and simply took every person in it and uh, shot, shot them all. And Edna Millay wrote a poem about Lita Che. And it was no longer the Edna Millay of the 20s. It was not the Bohemian. She was this, it was this impassioned cry of grief, this eulogy for these dead Czech, innocent Czech civilians whom the Germans had slaughtered. And that I read as a little boy, and that was my first image of, of Edna Millay, not as this sexy bohemian burning the candle at both ends, but of this war poet, serious, solemn uh, war poet. I shall die, but that is all I shall do for death. I hear him leading his horse out of the stall. I hear the clatter on the barn door. He is in haste. He has business in Cuba, business in the Balkans, many calls to make this morning. But I will not hold the bridle while he cinches the girth, and he may mount up by himself. I will not give him a leg up. Though me, he may flick my shoulders with his whip, I will not tell him which way the fox ran, with his hoof on my breast. I will not tell him where the black boy hides in the swamp. I shall die, but that is all I shall do for death. I am not on his payroll. I think actually people like Wilson and Ed Millay uh, were the beginning of the end of the classic period of the of village uh, ferment. Um, uh, in the 30s, everything got very political. In the 40s, everything got cute. The change began in 1918, when the 7th Avenue subway cut through the village, widening the street and knocking down houses. But safely hidden away in Patchen Place, poet and painter E.E. E. Cummings continued to delight in village life. Give me the square in spring, the little barbarous, greenwich, perfumed faith, and most the futile, fooling, 
labyrinth where noisy colors grow. With Prohibition, the village lost its protective isolation. Nightclubs and speakeasies flourished. Tourists frequented fantasy places like the Pirate's Den. Postcards highlighted famous village streets. Tea room owners cajoled well-known artists into their places to attract more customers. The village became a parody of itself. Even the movies promoted this stereotype. The rebellious mood of the teens dissolved, and the bohemian community dispersed by the end of the 20s. Village life went dormant, and the realtors got to work. Rents started to rise, buildings were torn down, new ones built. The landscape started to change in the 30s, and by the 40s, the village was fashionable again. Throughout this period of transition, the village still supported restaurants, bars, and cafes, and a remnant of its independent spirit. In the 50s, a new group of writers and painters known as the Beatniks jostled the village out of its sleep. Poetry readings became regular events at 116 McDougall in the Gaslight Cafe, featuring Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Jack Kerouac and the beat generation of writers haunted bars on Bleecker and McDougall and burned the candle at both ends with a vengeance that might have shocked even Edna. By the 60s, the hip poetry place known as The Scene became Café Borgia, catering to a new set of singers and writers. Bleecker Street sprouted clubs featuring folk music, comedy, and jazz. The village started to breathe free once again, home to another generation of disillusioned youth rejecting bourgeois society and calling for change. And you, who philosophize disgrace? Bob Dylan was one of the new village rebels. He berated war, condemned social injustice, and called for change. From your face. Now ain't the time for your tears. Dylan found his muse in the rhythms and cadence of the street, in the tempos of a new age coming to be, as did a predecessor a century before. Positively, 4th Street was an address where Walt Whitman also felt at home. Whitman was among the very first village bohemians. His crowd gathered at Pfaff's in the 1860s. This bleaker and Broadway basement beer hall was the center for a group of literary men and a few independent women who believed in radical politics, personal freedom, and sexual frankness. Whitman enjoyed the talks at the long table, but he would observe as much as participate. He observed his friends, he observed his city, he wrote about the rich and the poor, the beauty and the chaos in the streets he loved. Although he wrote almost 150 years ago, his city sensibilities inspired poet Galway Cannell, who lives in the village and continues in the tradition begun by Whitman. What I love most, I guess, is that uh, combination in Whitman of the almost um, um, idolatrous adoration of the particular thing of the people and places and smells and sights and sounds of the actual world on the one hand, and on the other hand, the quality of a, a cosmic hymn, a song of praise to existence itself. The floor men are laying the floor. The tinners are tinning the roof. The masons are calling for mortar. This is the city, and I am one of the citizens. Whatever interests the rest interests me. Politics, churches, newspapers, schools, benevolent societies, improvements, banks, tariffs, steamships, factories, markets, stocks, and stores, and real estate, and personal estate. They who piddle and patter here in collars and tailed coats, I am aware who they are, and that they are not worms or fleas. I acknowledge the duplicates of myself under all the scrape-lipped and pipe-legged concealments. Every thought that flounders in me, the same flounders in them. On reading Whitman, I wanted to write a more uh, cadenced poetry that would um, conform more easily to my feelings about the world um, 
that um, I was writing about. Um, and I also remembered, I also had read somewhere that, or maybe I just imagined that Whitman had his little, would walk around with his pencil and notebook, you know, poking his head in here and in there and just writing down phrases and, and uh, so forth. And um, that's what I did. I just, um, uh, I fell in love with my neighborhood, as a matter of fact. And um, without thinking of Whitman, I just um, began writing about this person or that person or the look of the pushcart market or whatever it might be. In the pushcart market on Sunday, a crate of lemons discharges light like a battery. Icicle-shaped carrots that wove through black soil lie like flames in the sun. Onions with their shirts ripped seek sunlight on green skins. The sun beats on beets dirty as boulders in cowfields, on turnips pinched in gibbous, on horseradishes still growing weeds on the flat ends, on cabbages lying about like sea green brains the skulls have been shucked from, on tomatoes, undented plum tomatoes, alligator skinned cucumbers that float pickled in the wooden tubs of green skim milk, sky flowers, dirt flowers, under dirt flowers, those that climbed for the sun in their lives and those that wormed away equally uprooted, maimed, lopped, shucked, and misaimed. In the market in Damascus, a goat came to a stall where 12 goat heads were lined up for sale. It sniffed them one by one. Finally, 13 goats started smiling in their faintly sardonic way. So the poem has an extremely loose structure. There is a kind of structure underneath it which is very hard to, um, you know, not too easy, not too um, obvious to a listener, and that is that there has actually recounts the stations of the cross of Jer from Jerusalem are uh, transplanted and uh, into uh, the Lower East Side. But, um, not many readers see that, and it's certainly not necessary to know that, but it just helped me to uh, construct the poem, to have that um, um, uh, plot. Children set fires in ash barrels. Cats prowl the fire. Scraps of fishes burn. A child lay in the flames. It was not the plan. Abraham stood in terror at the duplicity. Isaac, whom he loved, lay in the flames. The Lord turned away, washing his hands without soap and water like a common housefly. The children laugh. Isaac means he laughs. Maybe the last instant, the dying itself is easier. Anyway, than the hike from pit, the blind gut to the East River of fishes. Maybe it is as the poet said, and the soul turns to thee, O vast and well-veiled death, and the body gratefully nestles close to thee. I think of Isaac reading Whitman in Chicago the week before he died, coming across such a passage and muttering, Oi, what shit, and smiling, but not for you, I mean for thee, sane and sacred death. Although Kinnell can still find inspiration in the streets, E.L. Doctorow's character in his novella, Lives of the Poets, sees the village of the 80s as a commercialized relic of the past. We come up in time 50 years and there's this hypochondriacal fellow um, worrying about his health and thinking of all the available uh, commercial expedients for his salvation available in the village. So this touches on what I've been talking about, the idea of uh, something come to an end, something being codified, commercialized, absorbed and uh, essentially destroyed. I notice this bump on, bump on my ankle seems to be getting bigger. The hell, and my throat is scratchy this morning. I just got over laryngitis. What is happening to me? On the other hand, this is the village. Whatever can be tried to stem disasters, tried here, so I'm ready for action. A free paper found in the lobby tells all about it. I can begin with lessons in the Alexander Technique, a proven method for attaining awareness in physical re-education re and postural alignment. And then I could go buy the Bach flower remedies, looking in on the breathing centers, 
Stop a while at the Center for Jewish Meditation and Healing. Sign up for some Tai Chi exercise in flowing motion for vitality and health. And if things don't work out, still I can submit myself to some deep tissue manipulation by a qualified rolfer. <laughs> The Gurdjieff discussion group might come in handy, and if I need some companionship, the loving brotherhood is there, making, quote, the planet a place where it is safe for people to love each other, unquote. Can't knock that. <laughs> when I get some pots and pans, I can do a little gourmet vegetarian cooking and restored in my energy balance, go out then for a whack at some functional integration with the Feldenkrais method. The Vedanta Society will bring all these things together for me, or else I can drop into the local tranquility tank where I can float in body temperature solution free from gravity. I feel better already. <laughs> but as I make my way along these various paths to fulfillment, maybe I ought to take some martial arts training so I can kick the shit out of anyone who tries to stop me. When I, when I was a kid and I come from the Bronx, the thing was to come to this great, open, free, wonderful place, Greenwich Village, and I did. So, and I think that was the way people felt in 1915 and 1916, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in 1925. And uh, of course, every time, any time people come, they say, "Oh, well, it really was great 10 years ago." And so I say the same. It really was great 20 years ago. You know, I mean, first of all, it's gotten extremely uh, much more affluent. Even though Grace Paley sees the realtors winning in this village cycle, like Kennell, she can still see the village as Whitman did and find a closeness to humanity in the streets. Her poem, Three Days and a Question, tells of three encounters on three different days. On the third day, I'm in a taxi. I'm leaving the city for a while and need to get to the airport. We talk, the driver and I. He's a black man, dark, he's not young. He has a French accent. Where are you from? Haiti, he answers. Ah, your country's in bad trouble. Very bad. You know that, miss? Well, yes, sometimes it's in the paper. They have thieves there. You know that? Very rich, very poor. You believe me? Killing. It's nothing to them, killing. Hunger, starving people, everything bad. And you don't let us come. Starving. They send us back. We're at a red light. He turns to look at me. Why they do that? He doesn't wait for me to say, well, because he says, why hard? The light changes. We move slowly up Third Avenue. Silence. Then why? Why they let the Nicaragua people come? Why they let the Vietnamese come? One time, American people want to kill them people, put bomb in their children, break up their head. Now they say, yes, 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 come, come, come. But not us. Why? Your New York is beautiful country. I love it. So beautiful, this New York. But why? Tell me, he says, stopping the cab, switching the meter off. Why, he says, turning to me again, rolling his short shirt sleeve back, raising his arm to the passenger divider, pinching and pulling the bare skin of his upper arm. You tell me, this skin, this black skin, why? Why you hate it so much? Question. Those gestures, those arms, the three consecutive days thrown like a net over the barest, unchanged, accidental facts. How come? Why? In order to become probably, in this city, one story told. Change has been the only constant in the history of the village. Each generation laments its own passing, but Greenwich Village retains a vitality all its own. It still provides a colorful palette and a rich character parade. The intimacy of a medieval village nestled in a modern metropolis.